as we gather together for worship this day. And today we're going to be taking a look at, and we continue on our series on Faces of Forgiveness, what does forgiveness look like when we've been dealt a really bad hand in life? Uh, it's not any one thing, but it's a series of things, and our life hasn't turned out the way we expected it to be, and it seems like everything is against us, and there's trouble upon trouble that, that has come. So what does forgiveness look like in that case, and maybe even how our relationship with God is and how we look at God and are we angry with God at, at those moments? So uh, we're going to dig into that. We're going to look at Mary, the mother of Jesus. So please stand and we make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. The first reading for today is Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones, and he led me around among them. And behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can those bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone, and I looked, and behold, there were there were sinews on them and flesh had come upon them and skin had covered them but there was no breath in them then he said to me prophesy to the to the breath prophesy son of man and say to the breath thus says the lord god come from the four winds O breath and breathe on these slain that they may live so i prophesied as he commanded me and the breath came into them and they lived and stood on their feet an exceedingly great army then he said to me son of man these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you, raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. The second reading for today is Romans 8, 1 through 11. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who will not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live in according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give you life, your mortal bodies, through his spirit who dwells in you. This is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the gospel, the holy gospel, according to St. John, the 19th chapter, verses 23 to 27. We read... When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top to the bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see 
whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divide up my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. This is the gospel of our Lord and praise to you, O Christ. Let us go before the Lord and pray um, just for this nation. My heart weeps for this nation and the direction we've gone as a, as a people. We're so far afield. Government is not going to be the savior for us. We need Jesus and we need Jesus desperately. Father, we come into your presence acknowledging our sinfulness as a nation, our utter brokenness as a nation. Lord, we have turned our back to you. We've turned our back on you. and we've, we've gone astray. We've gone our own way. And we're reminded, Lord, in the words of Isaiah the prophet, we all like sheep have gone astray. And the punishment that we deserve has been placed on him. So, Lord God, how can we thank you enough that even though we, have, we go astray, you pursue us not to condemn us, but to forgive us. But our heart breaks and we cry out for, to you on behalf of this nation that we would humble ourselves and turn to you, the true and the living God, and forsake our evil and wicked ways, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that we would, as the church, be about what you have called your church to be, to be a light in this world, to point people to Jesus, to hold firm to the testimony of the faith, to hold firm to the words of Jesus, to hold firm to what you have revealed to us in your word and not sway to the right or to the left. Lord, how far astray we've gone as the church, how far astray have many in the church gone seeking their own path, seeking their own way and making you, Jesus, into the image they, they want you to be instead of you remaking us into your image. Father, forgive us, change us, transform us, draw us to yourself. We pray, Lord God, for revival to come to this nation, for revival to come to your church, for that we would, we would truly humble ourselves before you and turn to you before it is too late, Lord God. For you stand at the door and knock, and you, you say, Lord, you're waiting for any of us to come and invite you to be with us, to sup with. And Lord God, help us to be open to you, to your invitation. By the power of your spirit, draw us to yourself. Transform us. Help us, Lord God, that we would forsake our wicked ways and turn to you, the true and the living God. We ask, Lord God, help us. Help us to be the church. Help us to be your people. Help us to be followers of Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. So we lift this before you, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, for a mighty move of your spirit amongst us. And Lord God, that the transformation would occur. So all these things we lift before you in the name of Jesus, who has taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. and lonely 
And all the thieves will come confess And know that you are holy And know that you are holy And all will sing out Alleluia And we will cry out Alleluia All the hearts who are content And all who feel unworthy And all who hurt with nothing left Will know that you are holy Will know that you are holy And all will sing out Alleluia And we will cry out Alleluia And all will sing out Alleluia And we will cry out Alleluia Go on and scream it from the mountains Go on and tell it to the masses That he is gone Shout it Go that he
Good morning again, and um, today's message is based on our gospel reading from John chapter 19, verses 23 to 27. John chapter 19, 23 to 27. And we continue our series on faces of forgiveness. We're going to look at the life of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word and the truth of your word. We're thankful for your persistence in loving us and caring for us. Help us to see that, Lord God, in the good times and in the bad times. Lord God, that we would look to you, for you are, sur you are surely our rock and our fortress, our salvation, in you we can trust. We praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So what does the face of forgiveness look like when you have been dealt a bad hand? It's not just one thing that has happened to you, but it's a series of things. And, and you find yourself five years down the road, 10 years down the road, your life is not the way you thought it would be. There are so many things that have happened in your life, so many disappointments, so many hurts, so, many, so, so much is just kind of, it's not one thing, but just a heap of things that have come upon you. And bad news after bad news that has come. Perhaps you're beginning to believe that, that God is, is against you. That, you know, maybe God needs to apologize to you. Maybe when we're talking about forgiveness, it's God that needs to apologize to you. Maybe even harboring thoughts along those lines. When we look at the life of Jesus, I think there's a tendency for many of, us to, many of us to think of him as this God figure that is pretending to be human. That what he went through was almost a charade. We forget that Jesus, while he was fully God, was also fully human. And we forget that the people around him that knew him, that loved him, that walked with him, were fully human. In this season of Lent, we rightly focus on Jesus' journey to the cross. But in that reflection, we must never forget that Jesus was fully human as well as fully God. And that his journey to the cross was not something done in isolation, but there were real, live human beings who experienced as witnesses the pain, the suffering, the death of Jesus as they witnessed what went on in his life and what he had to endure. No one knew that more than Jesus' own mother. We see her this morning in the gospel reading, standing there at the foot of the cross, looking up at her very own son's mangled, brutally beaten body, struggling to take each breath, while evil, callous men could care less, dividing his clothes amongst them, casting lots for his tunic. What does the face of Jesus and the, well, the face of forgiveness look like when life in all of its cruelty comes pressing in on us and you're dealt a hand that you absolutely did not want? Is there anger towards God? Do you sink into depression at that time? When I was in elementary school, we were friends with our next door neighbors, people who lived right across the street from us. They had three children. There was a, they had a son who was my age. They had a daughter who was the age of my older sister and another daughter who was a few years younger than their son, the son that was my age. I was friends with her son, whose name was Doug, and my sister was friends with their daughter, whose name was Cindy. 
Unfortunately, the younger sister, the youngest one, was diagnosed with leukemia at a young age of eight years old. Her name was Michelle. She fought a courageous battle against that leukemia, against that cancer. When I was 11 years old, I remember Doug and I were playing in the basement of my house. I think we had set up some kind of constructed something out of our, the blocks that I had down there and the army figures that I had down there. And his parents had once again been at the hospital. I wasn't aware of how serious things were. Doug's parents returned from the hospital and his father came down the stairs into our basement. He said words that I wasn't expecting to hear. He said, Doug, your sister has died and she's in heaven. I ran up the stairs in disbelief. How could someone so young die? She died at the age of nine. It was my first encounter with a young person who would be taken at a very young age. It doesn't seem fair, and we might wonder, does God really care? How do we forgive God when something like this happens? There is no indication in the scripture, despite everything that Mary, the mother of Jesus, saw done to her son, all that she went through in her life, harbored any animosity towards God for the hand that she was dealt. But how? Two things I want us to think about. First is that Mary recalled the many small ways that God was with her throughout her life. If you remember, after the birth of Jesus, when Jesus was just 40 days old, in accordance with the law of Moses, they took Jesus to the temple for the rite of purification. And there were some people there. One was a prophetess, Anna, and another was an old man, Simeon. And Simeon said this, Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Jesus' mother, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Was God preparing Mary for the horrors that would occur later in life to her son? And then, also in there, the prophetess Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, she was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years, and when she was a vir from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow uh, until she was eighty-four, she did not depart from the temple, worshiping and fasting and praying night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of Him to all who are waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Speaking of Jesus to all who were waiting for the redemption of Israel. And then at age 12, Jesus is again in Jerusalem and he's at the temple and his parents start heading home. He thinks he's, his parents think he's with the rest of the crew heading home with his cousins and so forth, but they realize he wasn't there and they go back. And after it says that after three days, they found him in the temple sitting among the teachers listening to them and asking them questions, and all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answer. And so after this event, it says, and his mother, that is Mary, treasured up all these things in her heart. All of these things, everything that was occurring. Over and over again, we're called in the scriptures to remember. 
to remember. There are 234 occurrences of the word remember in the scriptures. Many of them point to what we are to remember. The Israelites were to remember what God had done to rescue them from slavery and from Pharaoh's hands. They were to remember how, to, how uh, God cared for them in the wilderness. They were to remember at the time of the Passover, their deliverance from the angel of death and their final, uh, final deliverance from captivity in Egypt. They were to remember through a series of, a whole other series of festivals, the, the uh, festival of booths and uh, all kinds of festival of ingathering, other festivals, to remember the acts of God in their lives. The psalmist uh, encourages us to remember God when we go to bed and to meditate on him when we can't sleep in the middle of the night. Jesus reminds his disciples to remember my words. In Paul's letter, he tells us to remember that at one time we were separated from God, aliens from God, but by now by grace we've been brought near to him. In Revelation, in the book of Revelation, we are encouraged to remember what we have received and heard. Why so much emphasis on remembrance? Well, for one thing, God knows us. It's easy, as, easy for us to forget. It's easy, as, easy for us to forget the good things that God has done in our life. When the bad hand comes into our life, if we have not treasured up the things of God, if we have not remembered the goodness of God, in our heart, like Mary did, then we don't have the capital, that relational capital with God to deal with the bad hand. Mary remembered. God had been with her, preparing her, working in her life. So even now in this horrendously dark hour, she remembered and believed that God was for her and not against her. Treasure God's faithfulness in your heart. Remember it. Whether it is by journaling or simply by meditating on those things, bring them to mind. Remember them. Then you will have treasure stored up for the day in which you need it. For the day in which maybe a bad hand is coming. The second thing we see from our gospel reading is that Jesus shows his faithful, loving care always. In the macabre or macabre scene of the brutal crucifixion that Mary is witnessing, the gambling for the clothes, the hardened soldiers who could, couldn't give a rip what's going on. Our gospel reading says, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. These are real live people who care for Jesus, who love Jesus who are watching this horror show unfold before them. None of them could be more horrified than Jesus' very own mother. A mother is willing to do anything for her child. And even though Jesus was a grown man, I am sure that Mary would have get, gladly exchanged places with him. But Mary couldn't. Mary wasn't the Savior Jesus is. Only Jesus, who was sinless, could take upon himself on that cross the sins of the whole world. In doing so, he put your care, my care, and yes, even his own mother's care above his own. For apart from his sacrifice, even his mother would be eternally lost. But Jesus 
goes beyond that sacrifice. Knowing that while he died to eternally save us, he is also well aware that there are times in this life right here, right now, when we need his care and support. So in all of his pain and discomfort, he still shows he is caring for others' immediate needs as he is caring for our eternal needs by dying in our place. And so we read in verse 26, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Mary had some more years to live on this earth before entering into eternity. What would those years look like? Would she spend them depressed? How can I go on with life over the hand that had been dealt her, over what she had witnessed, over everything she had gone through? Would she hold on to anger towards God over the life she had? From every indication in the scriptures, we know that that is not the case. Instead, she continued to serve and to follow God. She recognized the love and care of Jesus in the most horrendous of situations. How do you think Luke, when he wrote his gospel, which I had read from earlier, when he writes in the gospel, Mary treasured up all of these things in her heart. How do you think he knew that? By talking to Mary, by interviewing her, for the gospel that he's writing. And he talks to her. And she, instead of concentrating on every negative turn and bad thing in her life, she recalled God's care and God's provision for her in the midst of these horrendous storms of life. And in that, she, comes, she becomes a face of forgiveness of one who knows that she has been forgiven and loved and cared for by God, even in the most horrendous of circumstances. And in doing so, her life had purpose and power, even today, as we remember her and her witness. So there are things we can do as we go through life. First of all, while it is today, remember God's faithfulness in your life. Bring them to memory. Recall them. They will be there for you when you need it. Remember the good things that God has done for you. Give thanks for them. And secondly, Jesus' love and care for you will show up in unexpected ways. Would anybody expect when Jesus is hanging on the cross to look down at his mother and say to John, behold your mother, and to Mary, behold your son, and that John would take her into his home? He will show up in unexpected ways at the time when you most need him. That family who lost their little girl, Michelle, they continue to attend church. They continue to worship God and God provided for them. How easy it would have been to not see God's provision and care, but they chose to see it and believe. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, despite the horrors of what she was seeing right now, chose to see the care and provision of God and believe. Father God, give us that kind of faith. Help us to recall your goodness while it is today, that we may bring those things to memory 
and help us, Lord God, to trust that Jesus is working. He cares for us. He loves us. And he will show up in unexpected ways in the midst of the hardships of life. We pray in your mighty name. Amen. Let us confess together our faith in the triune God and all he has done for us. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We have a, a time of confession before the Lord. And the Lord knows what's really on our heart. But what he's inviting us to do is come before him, be honest before him, come into his presence. Uh, don't hide anything from him. Run to him. It's a mistake for us to run from God. We should run towards him and confess to him. So let us, let's open our hearts and our minds to him. There'll be a time of silence as well that we can really pour out our hearts to God. So from... The words uh, from, the, from 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take a moment in silence to reflect upon our need for Christ. So, Lord, let us confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. But for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the gift of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining us for worship this day. Holy and mighty is God, the everlasting, the one who has come to us, not to condemn us, but to forgive us. Draw unto him. I encourage you this week to press into knowing him more deeply, to remember the good things that he has done in your life, to recall them, to meditate upon them, and to know that Jesus is for you, that his love never fails, that he provides for us in our deepest, uh, deepest need that we have in our life. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.